this is episode 117. My name is Matt, and this is the weekly podcast discussing everyday tech for everyday people. And in this week's episode, I'm going to take a trip back in time. We don't do that very often on this show. What I'd like to talk about today is what I believe to be the start of modern civilization. Now, if you were to ask some of my students today, when do you believe the start of modern civilization would be, they might say something like the invention of the iPhone or smartphone, invention of mobile devices. If you talk with someone in my generation, they may say something like the invention of the internet or the personal computer. If you talk with someone from, say, my parents' generation or my grandparents' generation, they may say something similar to the invention of the atomic bomb or the invention of the microchip or the transistor or going back to the invention of automated weapons like the machine gun in World War I. And I would have to disagree with most of them, although those were very important moments in history. I wouldn't say that led into sort of the modern world that we have today. And what I want to talk about is an event that happened in the mid-1880s that changed the world in more ways than we could ever imagine. So what I want to talk about today is the eruption of the volcano Krakatoa. And for those of you who don't know, uh, it is the largest volcanic eruption, most powerful volcanic eruption in modern times. And so this this process got me started thinking a few months ago, about, about I'd say two months ago, I was just out for a drive and I forget exactly what happened, but a series of events made me start thinking of what was the loudest sound ever recorded. So I was driving and I think I, I put uh, my, I hooked my phone up to my car and my speakers were really loud and it, the sound was ear piercingly loud in my car. And I was on my way to our local mall to to grab some dinner. There's a really great Chinese food place there. They've been around for years. The family is a great family. And uh, we like to support them from time to time and keep them in business. So I was walking from my car to get dinner. And I started thinking about what was the loudest sound in history. And I started thinking immediately, my first train of thought would be, the atomic bomb. And then I thought, well, no, now there's the hydrogen bomb. So that can't be it. And I know the, uh, the Russian czar Bomba was the, the most powerful nuclear weapon ever tested. So I started thinking it might be that. And so I did some research and the answer to this question was something that I, I guess I knew deep back, back in the deck, the back of my mind, I knew the answer, but had forgotten about it. So the volcanic eruption of Krakatoa in 1883 is the largest, largest explosion in history that we have ever been able to record. Now, now, why would you say something like a volcanic eruption would lead into our modern world, modern technology? Well, let me give you an example of what was happening before Krakatoa erupted. If you're not sure where Krakatoa is, it's in the uh, Indonesian islands near the islands of Sumatra and Java. And it was an, uh, an island that was about six miles across. And prior to the eruption of Krakatoa, business seemed to be moving. The world was expanding. Shipping was getting easier. And trade routes were increasing in popularity. So if you want to think back during that time period, uh, England played a major role in the world. And many of their shipping companies would travel to the east and collect spices, pepper, and many other uh, rare uh, items that that came from the east. So they'd take ships around the Cape of South Africa and trading with these new cultures uh, that also did a lot of business with the Dutch. It was a it was a very large money making deal. And they would send these ships, first small ships, then as the technology got better, they would send bigger ships, eventually ships made of steel. 
With them, they'd send cartographers out to map unexplored areas. And that influence from the Dutch spread throughout the Indonesian islands, where there were rare things like rubber trees that weren't found in many other places. So the shipping industry started, and it took a long time, but they established a relationship with the locals. Trade increased, and the, the world expanded a little bit. Now, along that same time, shortly before the eruption of Krakatoa, you had new things in the world. Science was getting better. You had things like the telegraph, telegram, the tele telegraph wires, Morse code. You had things like barometers that were measuring atmospheric pressure to study the weather. But we hadn't really seen a whole worldwide community just yet. Things were expanding, but worldwide community and worldwide communication was still very rare or even unheard of at the time. Now let's take a look back of the eruption of Krakatoa. So when did it happen? It happened between August 26 and August 27, 1883. Now the biggest difficulty in studying Krakatoa was that then there were no world time zones. And so these islands in the Indonesian islands, they sort of had their own time that was different from everyone else. So it's hard to pin down the exact times that a lot of this happened. But basically what happened was there was a series of three to four major explosions on the morning of the 27th. Now, Krakatoa had been giving signs of eruptions for months leading up to this event. And in the past, there have been several major eruptions from Krakatoa that are also on record. And on the morning of the 27th and the days leading up to that point in time, there were weird events happening. The locals could feel earthquakes not coming from the ground, but coming from the air itself. Now, if you can imagine the feeling of uh, changes in atmosphere, atmospheric pressure and a shaking sensation from the air, you would be rather disturbed by it, not really knowing what it is, what to expect. But there were very few people knew, that knew that it was coming from the volcano. And there were people close by collecting data from the island and the islands surrounding Krakatoa that knew exactly what this was. It was coming from the, the, the volcano, and they were expecting an eruption. But little did anybody know exactly how powerful this eruption was going to be. So one of the very last explosions on the 27th was the largest volcanic explosion in history. There, were, there have been eruptions that were lasted longer, but this one... The entire six-mile island of Krakatoa was gone in an instant. And the explosion was so loud, it was beyond the scope of human hearing. It was about 310 decibels, instantly killing about 1,000 people close by. This explosion deafened sailors on ships 40 to 50 miles away. It also created a tsunami in multiple directions that went for thousands of miles. The effects of that tsunami from the Indonesian islands was measured in the English Channel. Now, when it reached the English Channel, it had lost all of its power, and the water fluctuated a few inches. But thousands of miles away, evidence of this tsunami uh, was shown on the west coast of Africa, in Australia, and the sound itself was heard by over 13% of the globe. So people in islands in the Indian Ocean or in Australia heard what sounded to be ships firing their artillery, but there were no ships to be seen. The sound wave from Krakatoa, the sound wave itself circled the earth anywhere from four to seven times. It was not heard by people because it was not audible, but instruments measuring the pressure in the atmosphere picked up the sound wave from Krakatoa. And every 12 to 14 hours, it would pick it up again. So this sound wave circled the earth four to seven times. The eruption was so devastating. It killed 36,000 people between the volcanic eruption and the tsunamis itself. It was one of the most 
explosive events in history, but at the same time, it was one of the most explosive events that because of all the changes in science and because of all the modern technology of the time, scientists could begin to research why this happened. And many of the locals feared it was their their local god being unhappy with all of the the new trade that was happening with all of the locals and the people from the west and of course scientists knew that this was just a volcanic eruption and what caused this so immediately following the eruption things began to happen that had never happened before one of those things being that messages were sent via the worldwide telegraph network spreading the news of the eruption of Krakatoa from the Indonesian islands all the way back to London, England. Now, there were several routes. One was a really fast, direct route, and one was a route that took longer that went through Asia, through India, through all the neighboring countries, in a step-by-step -step process, eventually the message being relayed all the way back to England. And one was more expensive than the other. The fast route was obviously expensive. And then this was eventually published in the, the London news and the newspapers around the area. So for the first time ever, news of a catastrophic event made worldwide headlines within the first day or two of it happening. And it wasn't until a few days or weeks after the event that people began to pick up on the sheer scope of the events. So for an example, I mentioned earlier barometers measuring the weather. Well, back then, the way the barometers would work is that they would write out on paper as the pressure changed, you'd see a slow increase in the pressure as it increased and a slow decrease in the pressure as the ink was being written over time. And, and scientists could go back and take a look at the changes in the barometric pressure. Well, as the sound wave circled the Earth, instead of a slow increase, there was a jarring jump, and then immediately the, the pressure would return back to normal. This was very new and very um, unheard of with these devices. So scientists started using the telegraph to communicate with other scientists in other towns and cities across Europe, even in the United States, and had them send their data back to England for study. And what they found was that this jump happened everywhere there was a barometric pressure reading. They happened at different times based on where the location was. And they narrowed down the scope and realized that it had come from the Indonesian islands and Krakatoa. And it was the pressure wave that was circling the earth. And they have it in written documentation that it happened at least four times. And some people speculate even more seven times. Along with this, you had gauges in the sea for, for ships coming in and docking that would tell the, well, just how, how deep the water was. And these gauges measured very accurately the water. And when the tsunami happened, in many cases, the water was sucked out into the ocean, leaving ships on dry beds for a short period of time until the water returned. And these water gauges had fluctuations all over the world, and including the English Channel, uh, which was a very minor change, but it was shown to have had some influence from the Krakatoa explosion during that time. So again, we're using scientific equipment and technology to research an event that happened that scientists had, had never really known of before. So Krakatoa threw so much rock and ash and pumice into the atmosphere that the sun was virtually blocked out for a couple of days. And within a couple of weeks, the sun appeared to strange colors to people all over the world because of all the dust that was in the atmosphere. What this actually did in the, Unor in the New York area, well, I guess in other places as well, but specifically in New York, it inspired a specific set of people that were in 
were inspired to create art based off of what they saw for the sunset. So they would take and they would create visual representations of what they saw with the sun setting with these strange colors and create beautiful artwork. So not only is it inspiring scientists to do more research, it's inspiring artists as well. And for the next few years, the global temperature was lowered by at least one degree. Immediately after the eruption, it was almost impossible to get close to where Krakatoa was. And the extent of the eruption was not known. And just like any major catastrophe, you have first responders. In this case, we had many ship captains looking to get close to Krakatoa. And they were amazed to find out that at least three quarters of the island, somewhere between two thirds and three quarters of the island, just vaporized. It was gone. And all of the ash and pumice was either sent into the sea or sent into the sky and carried downwind. We're talking about a six mile island that was there and then suddenly gone. Thinking about this a little bit, it sort of reminded me of um, the story of Vesuvius in Pompeii. And if you go and you look at history, we've all heard the stories of, of Vesuvius and how the local area was just covered and sort of fossilized for a thousand years. That volcanic eruption surprisingly had no nowhere near the amount of force as the Krakatoa eruption. In fact, there have been other eruptions recently, uh, Pinatubo in 1991. Over 20,000 people were evacuated. Global temperatures fell, fell by a half a degree. That was considered uh, extremely powerful. The plume height of that rose to 20,000, or excuse me, 20 kilometers. So that's about 12 and a half miles. And the Krakatoa eruption, the plume went about 15 and a half miles. And these aren't even the most powerful eruptions that have ever happened. Uh, in fact, you could go back to the supervolcanoes of, say, Yellowstone National Park two million years ago, something like that. And even those aren't nearly the most powerful eruptions in history. We've actually detected a, a volcanic eruption on Io, what they call a, a hyper eruption, with volcanic plumes going over 31 miles high. And it's the largest volcanic eruption in the solar system. It was visible, visible with a telescope pointed at Jupiter's moon. And in this case, the, the eruption occurs so frequently that the moon is sort of a yellowish red. So this volcanic eruption, the most powerful explosion on Earth that we've measured, did a lot of things after the eruption as well. One of those being the study of how life returns to an island. Krakatoa was wiped out. And within 20 years, I believe it was in 1906, for that long, it was, it was kind of known to, to those with ships to get in and out of that area as quickly as possible. But I believe in 1906, they came and they saw activity happening under the water, bubbling of the water. And for the next 20 years, land would emerge out of the water and then be eroded away by the powerful seas. And in 1927, a new landform came up out of the water. And it took about four times of this doing this before the land took hold. And a new spot of land, a new island, was beginning to form again. And shocked many people because they thought Krakatoa was no longer. And this island, now starting to take a foothold, gets bigger and bigger. Life forms start to return from a microscopic spider to grasses and ferns to, as years go on, trees and small jungles and small birds and other lizards start coming to the island from various means. And scientists had to study how they all got to the island. And they took very good care of not bringing this themselves, just like we would take care of, of traveling to Mars and not bringing life forms to Mars. They took good care of of not being the cause of their study. So over time, from 1883 to the mid-1900s, this island starts growing. And 
very frequently, Krakatoa still erupts. And every time it erupts, it gains in height, going from just about nothing at all to now a peak that is several thousand feet high in just a little over a hundred years. And the new island now going by the name Anak Krakatoa, which is basically means the son of Krakatoa, still erupts to this day. In fact, as I was researching this, just a, just a week or two ago, there was an eruption of Krakatoa, which I found was really interesting to learn about. Now, why do I say this was sort of the, the birth of modern world or modern technology? Well, for the first time, we have worldwide communication. We have the telegraph network. We have newspaper articles being printed and information being shared worldwide. That has never occurred before. We have a worldwide trade route. And oddly enough, we talked about the rubber trees that were, that were rare to that one island. Oddly enough, before Krakatoa happened, luckily, some of those rubber trees and the seeds that go along with those trees were taken. Otherwise, we wouldn't have rubber trees in the world. It's very interesting to hear that. Other things like Islam taking a foothold in the East, including the Indonesian islands, created major changes for the future. Now, the story is obviously in much more detail than we covered here today. But I really think this one event changed our future and turned us from a sort of nationalistic approach to governance to a worldwide community. And I really think that this would be the key turning point in becoming a modern world, leading to science, research, discovery, new technologies, greater communication, advanced weaponry, all from one event. It was, it's, it's kind of interesting to, to think about it in that way. If you'd like to know more about Krakatoa, there's a great audiobook that goes into way more detail than I can cover in a short podcast. And the name of the book is Krakatoa, written by Simon Winchester, narrated by Simon Winchester, talks about the 1883 eruption leading up to it and beyond it. It's a real fascinating book. I, I highly encourage anybody wanting to check that out. And so there you go. If you, if you wanted to know what the loudest sound was ever recorded, it's Krakatoa. And even though there are more volcanoes that were that had bigger eruptions, including the 1816 eruption that created the summer without a winter, or the uh, year without a summer. This one, key turning point in the timeline of history, leading us to a modern and technological world. Interesting, interesting stuff. So that's going to do it for this week's episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. You can take a listen to all the other shows, all the other episodes of this podcast over at podnuts.com. You can also send me an email, mrptechreviews at gmail.com. I'd love to hear some feedback from you. What do you want for shows in the future? What do you want for um, topics, ideas? Give me some feedback on some of the recent episodes. I'd love to hear from the audience members. You can support this show by going to my website, mrptechreviews.com. You'll see a button that will bring you to Amazon. Just click on that button. If you buy anything at Amazon, I get a small percentage back. That helps me keep recording the show. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. We will see you next time.